So this is our first video for chapter four topics on data sets and tables. And we're gonna look at a couple of different things for large data sets. Now, the one I have here, the sheet that we're gonna be working with, doesn't have a lot of information in it. There's only 24 rows of data in it with one header row. But you know, we have to anticipate that maybe we have, instead of 20, 24 rows of data, maybe we have 250,000 rows of data or 25,000 or just 250. So we need different ways to navigate around our sheets in order to be able to um, be like, say in those higher rows or higher columns, but still have an understanding of what we're looking at. So one of the ways we can do that is by taking a look at views. So going to our view tab and taking a look at freeze panes. Now with free pa freeze panes, we have the options that we can keep the top row static or we can keep the first column static. So let's take a look at what happens when we keep the top row static. So I'm just gonna come out, take away the zooming a little bit. And I'm also gonna get rid of the grid lines because here you can see that there's a horizontal line there. If I go back to freeze panes and go unfreeze panes, that horizontal line goes away. So let's put it back, freeze panes, freeze top row, and see what happens when I do that. So now when I scroll down, that top row, row one, the top row, stays static. When I cursor to the right or cursor to the left, again, we can see the row one. If I go back to freeze panes and go to unfreeze panes and then reselect it, but go freeze first column. And you can see here from the little diagrams that are beside the um, descriptions, freeze first column will keep the first column visible while scrolling through the rest of the worksheet. So if I do that, <coughs> you can see now I have a vertical line showing up. And if I cursor up and down, nothing seems to have changed. But now if I cursor to the right, that column A is always visible, okay? So if we wanted to um, freeze just the first column or freeze the first row, we could use the top row or first column options. And I'm just gonna unlock that for now. What we would typically like to do though, is freeze maybe certain rows and certain columns. So if I come here to A2 and I go into freeze panes and freeze panes, notice how again, the row one is static, but no column is static. So something that we have to do, if we want certain columns and rows to freeze, we're gonna to have to be very careful for where we are in our spreadsheet. So for example, if I put my cursor in B2, and go again, freeze panes. So keep rows and columns visible while the rest of the worksheet scrolls. And notice here, I see how it says based on current selection. So again, in the diagram, you can see the little dark blue square is the current active cell and all the rows above it and all the columns to the left of it will remain visible. So now when I go freeze panes, you can see I've got that vertical line showing that a column has been frozen and the horizontal line showing that a row has been frozen. So when I cursor down, I can see row one all the time. And then if I cursor across, I still see row one, but my columns do move over, but the column I can always see is row A. And I'll just go control home to come back. Now, something very important when we're doing this type of freezing panes, so let's unfreeze them for right now. And let's take a look at maybe inserting some lines and we'll put a couple more lines in here. And I'll just put a uh, maybe heading, like free data. And maybe we'll put here today's date. Okay, and we'll change this. Maybe we'll give it a, actually we'll do this across and we'll give that a heading one formatting. Now, say I wanted to also see rows one to five and then freeze everything from one to five plus the header row, row six. If I put my cursor in the active cell A7 and go back to view, freeze panes 
and now freeze panes, you can see here that now rows one to six are all frozen because that's the active cell that I was in and there's more than just the header row above it. Something a little different, if I unfreeze that now, if I cursor down, so maybe I can just see from row three down and I'm in the same cell, A7, freeze panes, freeze panes. Well, the same thing happens, you know, row six, five, four, and three are there. But if I try to cursor back to see rows one and two, they're not visible. So one of the things we have to be aware of is that if we do want all rows one up until where we froze, and if we want all of those visible, we're going to have to make sure, so let's go unfreeze panes, that we can see them before we activate the freeze panes. So again, if I'm in A7, I can see rows one to six above it, freeze panes, freeze panes. Now I can see that rows one to six are all frozen, but one to five are visible because they were visible when I did my freezing panes. Now that was if we just had the um, <coughs> row that we were interested in. Say for example, and let's take off our freeze panes. Say for example, we wanted to see everything, the columns A and B, we wanted those always visible. And we wanted the row six and under always visible. So again, make sure that you can see them. Put our cursor in C7 and now go freeze panes and freeze panes. And now notice we have that vertical line and the horizontal line. So if I scroll down, I can still see rows one to, one to six. And if I scroll across, I can still see rows one to six. And I also can still see columns A and B. So these are just different little features that we can use in order to be able to navigate and be able to scroll down and across to be able to see and understand the context of our data. So I'm just gonna unfreeze the panes there. Now, other things that we might wanna be able to do for a large data set is for our printing of it. And for printing, one of the easiest ways to do that, and again, it's under the view tab, or we could look at the icons on the bottom right, is go to the page break preview. And Excel comes up with an idea or with a, a um, layout that anticipates, okay, this looks like the layout that would work for you. Now, this whole sort of white highlighted area, that's our selected range. And we have here, because that's all our information in our sheet. So it sort of automatically picks that up for us. If I go over to page layout, we can see here that we have print area. And here I can set my print area or clear my print area. So say, for example, I just wanted to print maybe this page one. I could come here and go print area and say, well, set that as the print area. Now you'll notice everything else here is darkened. And if I just click on the page or even outside it, you can see that that's the only print area. If I want to clear that, I can clear the print area and then Excel will default to what it anticipates is all the information in my particular sheet. In addition with the, to the print area, notice how it has created three different pages here. And actually there's a fourth one, it's a small one. And these vertical lines are the page breaks and I can move them to where I'd like them to be. So I can just click it and drag it or I can click it and drag it. And again, this one here, Let's drag it over here. So now I have four pages. If I wanted to see what that would look like on a printing, I could come to my page setup, go into my print preview, and then see there's gonna be four pages. There's page one, two, three, and four. And then we can come back. I can also um, move my pages, let's say down here, I could pull this up. And that's another way that I can set my print area by sort of dragging the pages to where I want them to be. I'm just going to undo that. And I'm going to say, okay, I'd like an actual page break to show up somewhere around here. So again, in our page layout tab, we can go to breaks, and I can insert a page break. And notice the page break shows up above 
the row cell that I was at. I was in A17 and the page break got put above it. And same type of thing, I can drag that break to wherever I'd like it. And now instead of the four pages, I've got eight. I could maybe, I wanna come here to the D6 and I could insert another page break. And now I've got a vertical one. And now instead of the eight, now I've got a couple more pages because I've split this one into two. And it shows you the number. So if it was going to print this, it would print it starting at page one, then down to two, three, then over, four, five, six, et cetera, as we go across. Now I'm going to take rid of or get rid of that last one. I could have come up here and I could remove all of the page break that I just did, or I could go breaks and reset all page breaks and then comes back to what Excel thinks is the logical reasoning behind it. And again, I'm just gonna fix things up a little bit. We'll put the page break there. Let's put one here and let's put one here, okay? Other things that I can do, same way we did like say with the freezing panes, if I want certain rows to repeat at the top, I can print titles or if I want certain columns to repeat on the left, I can print titles. So I can go to print titles. It opens up my page setup window. And on the sheet here, we have rows to repeat at top. So let's pick these six and then columns to repeat at the left. Let's pick columns A and B. And notice here, this was the page order of printing down and then over. So remember we had the one, two, three, four, et cetera. We could switch that to over and then down, okay? So whichever makes sense to you. It's good practice though, to check your print preview. And we can see here now, well, now I have the seven pages. So there's, notice how the rows are all repeating and columns A and B are repeating, okay? And I'll just come back here. Something else that you can notice when in this print preview, you also have access to page setup. And we can see that the same page setup window comes. So I'll just cancel out of that for now and we'll get out of our printing. Notice when I did do that print preview though, it sort of changed things around a little bit. It's saying that, you know, we have these different symbols here for the dotted line and the solid line for page breaks. The dotted lines are the ones that Excel has automatically entered. The solid lines are the ones that I've put in. So for example, I could take this one and drag it over. So now it's solid because I've manually inserted that. Same thing here, maybe I do that and maybe I do that. Okay, and we can see here that the pages are rough, are different sizes for what I've done. So maybe, you know, we have an idea that we want five columns on each page. So there's our five, maybe this last one has to be six. So, you know, we can sort of see that there's slight differences. Notice as I play around with the different scales, if I move this to be very larger, notice how the scale up here changed to 61%. Because Excel is basically picking up that I want this more information showing up on a single page. So it's making it smaller. If I bring it back to those five columns, we've got five here, we've got six there. So let's go five. Notice it's still at the 61. And let's maybe just for fun, let's insert a page break here. And it's still saying 61% scaling will fit on all of these. So the scaling is the um, stretching or, string or shrinking to allow of the information to allow it to fit on a particular size of paper. I'm gonna get rid of some of this. I'm gonna go back to get rid of that page break. I don't want that one up there. And I'll move this over and we'll see what happens. If I change this scaling, Okay, this is where it doesn't look like anything's happened here. But if we go into our page setup and print preview, it's showing that there's four. So there's my four pages and my page setup. Notice how it changed the percentage. Okay, so it does a lot of things automatically for us. 
other things that we can do within this page setup. We've looked at margins and orientation before. We can pick page, uh, page, uh, paper size. We've looked at breaks now, and we also looked at the print titles. We can view our grid lines or print the grid lines. So let's take a look. If we choose all of those and go to page setup and print preview, notice how now the grid lines are showing and all the row and the column headings are showing. They're not typically things that we want to see. So, you know, we might just say view them or I took the view off when I wanted to see the, um, the freeze pane horizontal and vertical lines. Other things that we can do in this, again, if we go to our page setup window, going through the different tabs, we can pick the orientation there or via the ribbon. We can do the scaling. We can make everything maybe fit to one page if we want, pick our different paper size, quality, et cetera. We can set margins. We have, if we have this option for setting margins, we can put in the numerical values. We'll look at the icon here in just a minute. But something else we can do is we can center our information on the page horizontally or vertically. So currently right now, the information will be justified to the top left-hand corner. If I go center horizontally, it moves it from the top left-hand corner into the center horizontally of the page. If I choose center vertically, now it moves it the center down. So if I sort of took the center across and then down, my data will be centered here. And I'm just gonna go okay for that. Up here, if we use the icon for margins, we have the option for custom settings we may have done before, normal margins, wide or narrow. And again, if we hit custom, we come back to that same window. We've taken a look at the header footer options. We've had to do this in chapter three for part of our assignments. So maybe I'll just add a, a footer for us here. I'll just call it val test. Then we'll put in the sheet name code and the file name code, go okay. Oh, I'm gonna come back to that custom footer and I'm gonna make the file name code in much smaller font so that it doesn't overlap. I'll go okay and I'll print preview. And now you can see the footer has shown up and my information now is centered vertically and horizontally. Let's come back to our page setup. Um, other things that we can do, let's bring our window. So we've done the page, the margins, and the header. We can take a look at the sheet. We can set our print area here if we like. We had set the print titles, so that's another option there. Again, we can decide to print the grid lines and row and column headings. We can change the order. And if we go into options, you know, it gives you a little bit more availability there, but you know, typically you don't take a look at that. If we go to the header and footer and options, Again, it's just bringing that to the PDF properties. And we could go advanced, you know, we could pick some paper size there. Now I have my printer currently set to PDF. We'll see why in a minute. But again, these are ones we don't tend to use too much. We stick with sort of this page setup dialogue and we'll go, okay. Now, something that's a good practice to do when you do wanna print things out and you don't wanna waste any paper, a nice little check you can do is for number one, do this page break preview. But then also when you go to print, so if you go, you can do printing two ways, right? You can go page setup, print here or print preview and then print, or you can just go file <coughs> and print. And a handy thing to do is to under your printer list, choose the print to PDF. It might be different on your computer, but you should have one option that's a default print to PDF. And when you print to PDF, it's actually going to create a file for you. So if I press print, it actually asks me for the um, file name that I want to give it. I'm just going to call this test2. It prints it. I can go into my file folder go to my documents, there's my test two. And now it opens it up because I saved it as a PDF. And now I can take a look and go, hmm, is this actually how I wanted it to look? And I can 
cycle through and make sure that my report is going to print correctly. So that's a good option to use when you want to, um, you know, verify that what you have set up in Excel and, you know, you've taken a look at it in the print preview and you sort of go, okay, look, it looks okay. You know, do one more check before you actually send it to a printer, print a PDF, check the PDF file, and then if everything looks fine, then switch to your um, actual printer and select print. Now we don't have to print for our course at all, but <clears throat> in the chapter four um, simulation training and simulation exam, they do ask you to hit the print button. It's just sort of printing into the ether, so to speak, because it's internal to the My Lab IT system. Okay, so you're not you won't, you're not actually physically printing anything. So that's our printing options. Now this is going to be important for your courses, maybe not this semester, but excuse me, most likely next year, when you're in different classes where you have to actually create and write reports. So I'm just gonna go back to my normal view here. So back into the normal view, we're gonna take a look now at some different options for different types of fill. Now we had done something called, and let me just fix the zooming here. We had done something called autofill or autocomplete before. And that's when we went, you know, I have a pattern and I want to continue that pattern. I highlight it, I double click, and it automatically fills. Or I highlight it and I drag it down and it automatically fills to where I want it to finish. An alternate way to do that is on the home tab you have a fill option, and that was a series fill. Now, in order for that to work, you obviously have to have your whole selection chosen or highlighted. We go fill, series, it picks up the step values, we go okay, and it automatically fills up. Well, there's another type of fill in Excel, and it's called a flash fill. And again, on the home tab, under editing fill, we have flash fill. Also under the data tab, we have flash fill. So let's see how we could use flash fill. And again, you know, we're anticipating that we have, um, you know, very, very large data set and we're trying to be efficient and productive and do things quickly. So maybe these drivers names that are just one cell right now, maybe I want them separated into first and last name. So I can start typing John. And then when I go to my next line, I go Shift and P to get the capital P. It picks up, as Excel is going, it looks like you're picking the first string out of column C. And see how it's starting to populate the rest of the cells. And now I can just go Enter. And it automatically picked those names. So again, and it's done it for the entire range of cells I have. So very, very quick to do. I'm going to undo it and undo it. I'm going to go again, John. I'm going to highlight my cells and I'm going to come up to flash fill. And again, it does it quite nicely. Okay. I'll undo it one more time. I keep my selection, home, fill, flash fill. And again, it does it nice and quickly. But you know, we saw how these last two ways I had to actually select the range, whereas the first way, and we'll see if it works again. It's not working for this one, but as soon as I hit the Carl, oh, it's not going to do it for that one. Once I start doing things in Excel, sometimes what happens is that the previous method, it's not, Excel won't pick up the previous pattern. This is the pattern I wanted you to see. So I'm going to pull the last names now. See how as soon as I started typing white, and then I can just go enter. I'm going to undo that again and undo the white, and I'm going to go highlight that, and I'm going to go control E. And again, it automatically picked it up. I'm going to delete those cells. I'm going to pick John, highlight John, control E and see how, again, something a little weird is working. So this is because I'm trying to repeat the same types of things in different cells, in the same cell, in different ways. 
So I wouldn't want to do that. So worst case scenario, I can highlight all my information, go to my data tab and go flash fill and it picks it up. So just recognize that, you know, Excel is smart. Sometimes it thinks it's smarter than us. And sometimes it does things a little differently. And you can see here for the flash fill for the last name, notice how it seemed to pick up an erroneous character. So if you do notice things like that, just, you know, fix your, fix your sheet up. Let's go over to the home. Let's clear, let's clear the, let's clear the, actually let's clear everything. Let's clear all. I'm gonna put the borders back up and then let's try it again. May, white, and now it's working fine. Okay, so just be aware, you know, try to be a little resilient. All software is like this. Uh, we're not going to remember every single little teeny tiny step with such, you know, extraordinary large and functional packages. So if things don't work, you know, my go to is, as I said up here, clear, clear everything, because maybe there's some type of code that I just haven't recognized, and I haven't cleared it, and then try it again, and it works fine. So this is a common feature used, flash fill, when you say you maybe want to separate some strings. Now, another method to do this, and we're going to highlight cell C7, the driver's name. And again, we're going to anticipate we want to separate them. We can go up to the data tab, and we can use this text to columns. And as it says, it's going to split a single column of text into multiple columns. So I click on text to columns. I'm going to drag the window over here delimited, what is the symbol, what is the thing that's separating the two strings? So there's my John May. It could be fixed width, so maybe you have 10 and 10, but in this case we don't because we have strings or, or names with different uh, numbers of characters. So we're just going to say it's delimited. We'll go to next. Well, what is the delimit delimiter? In this particular case, it's just a space, so I'm going to get rid of the tab and notice how it's separated the two strings, okay? And I could have other ones or I could have some text qualifiers. I'm gonna go next. I'm gonna format as a text. So we're gonna say, this is text. And then for the general one, we'll make that text. Okay, so we can do them individually. And then I'm gonna say, well, where do I wanna put it? I'm gonna put it over here in F7. And it automatically picks the absolute cell reference. And now watch when I hit finish says there's data there, but not to worry. We can just go OK, because we can clearly see there's nothing there. We can go OK, and now it's separated the names. Now, if I wanted to do this again with the rest of my information, I could highlight them all. Again, text to columns, delimited, next, space, next, put it where we want it to be, starting in F8. Go finish, there's no data there, so we can go okay, and it's done. So there might be instances, and often there are instances in business where maybe we've uh, inherited some databases or some Excel files from previous workers or owners that have information that's combined in one cell and we want it separated out, okay? So those are two ways we can do it, with the flash fill or the text to column. Now for our amounts, we've seen this before. That's just a formula where we can go equals and we can say the price times the number of items and equals. And we can just double click and the formula is copied down. I'm showing you some of these different things because when we start to do things in Excel tables, we're gonna be doing the similar type things, but in maybe slightly different ways and maybe more efficient ways. Now you can see here that I have some emails that I've tried to create it. So oftentimes we have information that we want to separate, like we did with the first name and last name. And other times there's going to be situations where we want to actually combine or join our information. So to create the email, I've tried to use what we call a text join function. So the delimiter is this is what's going to be inserted between each text item the decimal or period. We're going to ignore any empty cells. The text we want to add, this is the first one, and we're going to use C7 
excuse me, to start with. And then we're going to add the at happy.ca. I'm just trying to make an email. And when we go OK, we can see that, it, well, it looks like an email, but I have an extra decimal and it's not showing up between the names. But that's because I tried using the driver's name. Let's take a look at doing it slightly differently. And this time I'm going to use the information in D and E columns where the names are separated. So let's take a look at the function. And we've got the delimiter I want to put in, the decimal. Ignore empty fields. Here's the first text, D8. There's the second text, E8. And then the at happy.ca. And again, we can see the preview of the result. And whether we look here or whether we go OK, we can see again the email hasn't worked out quite how we wanted. So if we wanted to do this, we'd have to do it in a much different way. We'll be able to do this, create an email in a nice, easy way in Excel tables. Let's take a look at our flash fill again. Let's try an example here. And let's just say that we want to just copy the information from the destination. Now, I could go equals and point to that cell, or I can just start typing. So there's Boston. And again, as soon as I hit N, so shift N to get the capital N, it's anticipating. It says, oh, it looks like you're pulling <coughs> the information from destination. And I can just go, OK. So those are the different options that we have for autofill, flash fill, joining information. Hey, we haven't figured out how to do that quite yet. We don't have to do it as part of this course. This is just that part is a little bit extra. But I just wanted to show you how it doesn't work nicely in regular data sets, but in a table, it will look a lot better. Now, the other thing that we want to take a look at for this particular chapter, this first section of our um, chapter four, is for sorting and filtering. So I'm going to highlight row six. And I'm on the data tab. I'm going to click on filter. And we get the little drop down arrows for filter. And remember, we had seen this before where maybe we wanted to look at a particular driver's name. So I filtered it for Carl. So now I'm just looking at Carl's information. And then maybe I wanted to look at just the microwaves for Carl. Okay. And he's only got one instance of that. So you can have a single filter you can have multiple filters. And again, the multiple filters will filter subset on your first one. So I did driver's name first, and then we went to microwave. If I maybe change that order, so bring everything back. So undo the filters. Let's do it this way. Let's go just microwaves starting. So filtering on items first, and then on Carl. See how we get the same result. Okay. Now, something that often many of us do, and let me just get rid of my filters here for a second, is we realize that in these filter boxes, these filter drop downs, we have the ability to sort. So I'm going to sort A to Z on the driver's name. So now all of Carl's stuff is together, etc. But now if I come over to item and I go sort A to Z on item, watch what happens to the driver's name. So I hit on a sort A to Z on items. My items are sorted, but now my driver names are no longer sorted. And notice how you have this little symbol here that this field has been sorted. Okay, so I'm just gonna undo that sort. We're going to just undo, undo, undo. And I'll get rid of the filter. Oh, this is actually where I want to be. I wanted to show you. You can also see the symbol change when you actually have a filter running. So here, say under date, there's no filter being executed. Here there is. So I'm going to come here and come back. So the best practice really for sorting is to not use these sort options in the filter. What you should be doing is using your sort icon. So sorting, find your values quickly by sorting your data. The advantage of using the sort icon versus the filter is that you can have more than one sort at a time and it drills it down. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. So when we click on sort, we get this sorting window. 
and my data has headers, so it's already picked up. So when I select here, whoop, this is doing this weird thing again. Let me cancel this out. Uh, let me get rid of these rows here. So I'm just going to delete those to make things a little simple. And we'll come back to, let's get the filter off. We should be able to use it with the filter on or off, but just for ease of looking at it, we'll take the filter off. I'm in my data. I go to sort. My data has headers. And here now, okay, something strange is happening because it should be picking up my headers. So let's take it off. Now we have columns A, B, C, D. Let's go data has headers. And we're getting this again. So let me just cancel this for a second. I'm just going to uh, save my file. I'll just make it test. And we'll do this again. We'll go filter. We're in our data. We'll go sort. Data has headers. And it's still doing that. <laughs> OK, all right. You gotta love Excel. So I'm gonna select this. I'm just gonna select my rows, go back to sort, header, and now I'm getting the names, okay? So again, just a bit of resiliency with Excel. You know, if things don't work, then, you know, try just doing some different options. You saw, you know, things were messing up for me a little bit, again, because I'm playing around versus actually doing set work per se, but, a way around it was I selected all my data and now my fields are showing up. So I'm going to sort it by driver's name. Okay. And then we're just going to do that A to Z. And then I'm going to add a level and I'm going to sort it by item. And I'll just leave that A to Z, but also I could change it Z to A. Maybe, maybe let's change it to Z to A. And now if I go OK, now you can see the driver's names are sorted. And then the items are sorted for each of the driver's names. OK, so we had Z to A, so that's why the washing machines are showing first. Let's try it again. And let's say that, you know what, I want to maybe change that order. I don't want it alphabetical. So let's go back into our sort. And for this, for the item, instead of using Z to A, we're going to use a custom list. Now, I already have one there, but we're going to show how to make a new list. So I'm just going to add up or I'm going to create one and I'm going to say I want to put microwaves first. And then I want TVs. So maybe I have a reason for wanting them this way. OK, and then washing machines. And what else do we have? Refrigerators. Okay. And notice I have them in a list. I could have gone comma space and just written them out that way, but I find it's a little easier, excuse me, for us to just put it into a list and then we can add it. And now we have that available and we can go OK. And for our custom list, it usually picks up the last one you just did. So there's the one I did with microwaves and TVs. And now, so notice how the washing machines came first. Now when I go OK, see how under Carl, I now have this custom list. Okay. So for sorting, you have a lot of different options. You can delete the levels. You can copy the level. You can add levels. If we go to options, you know, we can do case sensitive different issues top to bottom, left to right. We don't get involved in this for our particular course, but we do do the adding the levels and the custom. Now let's just add one more and see how when I had add level, it put it between driver's name and item. If I didn't want it there, I would just select it and delete it. If I'm on this last one, now when I add level, see how it goes to the bottom. So watch out if you have a particular sorting order that it has to be by, say, column D, then column F, then column A. Make sure you have them in the right order. So I don't think this is really going to work here for this one because I don't have a lot of data. So let's just do transport A to Z. And so we've got Carl. There's the items Z to A. No A to Z I have that. No, that's the custom 
order I did. And then here we have truck one and truck three. So that is ordered. Okay. Now the difference here is that on the little filter drop down, you don't see that sorting. Okay. But as I mentioned, best practice, sort using the sort icon. All right. I'm just going to go back to my sorting and I'm going to get rid of these different levels. Oops, click here, delete, delete. Okay, I'm going to add a level and I'm just going to sort everything by order number, just so it goes back to the original way I had it. Something else we can do on the data tab. So we've taken a look at sort and filter. Now, if we just have a single sort, we can do this A to Z, right? Okay, but for multiple, we want to use the icon. We've also used the text to columns, and we've also used the flash fill. And I've shown you in previous lessons how to do some data validation. Okay, again, that was beyond the scope of our course. Let's take a look now at removing duplicates. So currently I don't have any duplicates. My order numbers go to 100,001 to 24. So I'm just gonna take rows four, five, six, and seven. I'm gonna copy them and I'm going to insert them here, insert my copied cells, and I'll hit escape to take my selection out. So orders three, four, five, six are showing up twice. So I'm in my information and I can go remove duplicates. And again, remove duplicates is under the data tab. So remove duplicates, and we're just gonna stick with the default. We could get fancy with picking the particular um, you know, unselect everything and then just pick the ones I want, but we're going to select everything. We'll go OK. It picks up that there's four duplicates. OK, so remember, we had uh, I had copied things and then it says, well, they were found and taken out. And now there's 23 remaining and I can go OK. So that's a handy feature. Uh, very often, you know, we, we might have data entry clerks repeating information and not recognizing that they've done it from one shift to another. So this would be a little quick check that we could run to do that. So we've covered a fair amount of stuff in this first lesson from chapter four, taking a look at the flash fill, the text to column, the formulas that we've seen before and just copying them down a little additional stuff with uh, text joining, but then also a fair amount on sorting filtering, sorting and filtering, and then also on the pay out, page layout, setting up all our different options here. Next video is going to be on tables, okay? And that will be the data in a table sheet.